Scorched Earth by Jonathan Crary. This is the second part of chapter one. Proponents of, oh wait, no, that's not the right. Okay, from the beginning, the social and commercial segments of the internet have provided innumerable tools for deception and manipulation. An array of platforms and applications not only enable but reward sociopathic behavior. The internet has bred a hybrid class of striving professionals and their many emulators for whom friendship, caring, and honesty are impediments to maximizing the enriching potential of online enterprise. At its most basic, the sociopathic denotes what is antisocial or injurious to the existence of a society and the depersonalization of most online interactions fuels the sociopath's remorselessness selfishness, and lack of empathy. One of the factors in the normalization of the internet complex was the promotion of a spatial model in which the billions of surface crawlers, people who use social media, Netflix, Amazon, are distanced from the deep web or the dark corners of the internet. But there is no separation or insulation from the pernicious objectives of the most powerful actors online. Once human communication becomes lodged in a system customized to the priorities of global corporations, the military, intelligence agencies, criminal cartels, sex traffickers, and depraved operators of all kinds, there is no more accountability to anyone or anything. It is the quintessential unregulated free market of late capitalism. The internet complex is uniformly and unalterably dark because the nihilistic maxim, everything is permitted, has been refashioned into the more corrupt form of everything is permitted, as long as it can be monetized and made available on demand. The pathology of the internet is not what is transacted in its less accessible circuitry, but rather in the naturalization of how our needs, desires, and affections are diverted or severed from a commitment to care for a world lived in common with others. The temporalities and values of an on-demand world are unlivable and the appetites incited are terminally insatiable. As recently as the late 20th century, it was still plausible to imagine global elites acting in limited ways on the basis of long-term consequences in class self-interest even if their policies involved crimes against humanity. In her 1999 book, The Lugano Report, Susan George presented a chilling parafiction para of financiers and corporate strategists concocting policies to ensure the survival of capitalism and the perpetual rule of the billionaire class. George simulated a working paper for a Davos-like summit meeting which identified the trends and policies that would safeguard corporate-led globalization and accumulation. The scandal of the Lugano report was its undisguised contention that capitalism's long-term prospects depend on a drastic reduction in world population, i.e. the deaths of a few billion human beings. Without such a decrease, it concludes the ensuing social unrest resource scarcity, and other instabilities will reach unma unmanageable levels. We cannot both sustain the liberal free market system and simultaneously continue to tolerate the presence of superfluous, unproductive billions. But this was not a Malthusian observation, for the report details the currently existing policies through which mass extermination is achievable. Some of these are political and financial measures to cause famine, epidemics, protracted and murderous intra-ethnic conflicts, environmental blight, sterilization programs, and the many deadly consequences of manufactured failed states. Since the book's publication, the coalescence of the actual forms of violence it outlined have led to over 8 million deaths in the Congo alone, while the death and ruination there and in many other regions continues. Now, however, with the post-2008 global economy on life support, with the growth of corrupt autocratic regimes in cartel states, and with the looming imponderables of the climate crisis, long-term calculation by powerful interests has given way to short-term forms of enrichment. This is casino capitalism at midnight, when the winning players begin to cash in their chips. 
because the global economy no longer has any long-term prospects, one last mad spree of plunder is now ongoing all over the planet. Fracking, mountaintop removal, mining, rainforest clear-cutting for biofuel farming, offshore drilling, wilderness despoliation, proceed alongside the ravaging and looting of social resources. The expropriation of the remaining fragments of a commons, whether drinking water, wilderness, or city parks. It's like a new version of the 1960s TV game show, Supermarket Sweep, where contestants were given a shopping cart and a time limit within which they could frantically grab anything of value in the store. As many have noted, the falsifications of the digital age have been so successfully inculcated that despite direct evidence to the contrary, there's a pervasive imaginary of the dematerialized status of digital technology. Material and environmental realities are conveniently veiled by mini miniaturization, the apparent intangibility of wireless setups, the placelessness of data, and terms like virtual or cloud. One of the many phenomena refuting these illusions is the ceaseless construction of new data centers and server farms to manage the massive increase in data production. These sprawling single-story structures have staggering energy requirements and generate levels of heat damaging to microcircuitry, which must be cooled at each unit using millions of gallons of water each day. At current exponential rates of data growth, the required number of server farms 50 years from now would cover vast areas of the land surface of the continental U.S. and other regions. The mythologies of a post-industrial information economy also obscure the persistence of earlier modes of production within the current scramble for resources essential to high-tech weaponry, communication networks, consumer technology products, solar and wind energy systems, and much else. Violence to both people and their lands defines these imperial and neo-colonial operations as it has several, several centuries, as it has for several centuries. The very possibility of a digital age requires the expansion of these destructive industrial practices to world vanquishing extremes. Using the historical framework of Lewis Mumford, our technological present is fully dependent on a paleotechnic paradigm of resource extraction specifically the activities of mining and drilling into the earth and laying waste to the land. As he outlined it, the Paleotechnic era began in Europe after 1750, in North America around 1850, and continued to define much of the world when he was writing in the 1930s. Equally important for Mumford were the institutional forms of discipline and subjugation needed to carry out these large-scale projects. He understood that the regimentation and debasement of workers' lives and the industrial degradation of the environment were related forms of oppression. For Mumford, the consequences of what he appropriately termed carboniferous capitalism included the wounding of sensory and perceptual experience amid the interconnected requirements of war and industrial production. A condition of partial anesthesia became necessary for survival. The state of paleotechnic society may be described as one of wardom. Its typical organs, from mine to factory, from blast furnace to slum, from slum to battlefield, were at the service of death. Competition, struggle for existence, domination and submission, extinction. With war at once the main, with war at once the main stimulus and underlying basis of this society, the normal motives and reactions of human beings were narrowed down to the fear of poverty, the fear of unemployment, the fear of losing class status, the fear of starvation, the fear of annihilation. The mine and the battlefield underlay all paleotechnic activities, and the practices they stimulated led to the widespread exploitation of fear. Mumford tempered his pessimism in the 1930s with the anticipation that a new, enlightened technological era might supplant these depredations. He had erroneous expectations that electronics, lightweight materials, and telecommunications would usher in a neotechnic era in which meeting social and environmental needs would become priorities. 
But by the 1960s, Mumford had abandoned this hopeful vision as he witnessed the establishment of a state of permanent war and the advent of more extreme forms of ecological damage. The technologies he had imagined as possible means of societal transformation had become integrated into the operations of multinational corporations and the military. The mechanized slaughter by U.S. forces in Vietnam and Cambodia were were only or was only one part of his realization that paleotechnic ideals still largely dominate the consciousness and politics of the Western world. Nothing better epitomizes the grim persistence of those ideals than the worldwide expansion of open pit mining, mining on a scale of magnitude and savagery that dwarfs comparable activity during the so-called industrial revolution or during the 20th century. At present, there are over 500,000 active quarries and pits employing over 45 million people, unearthing minerals as well as the sand and gravel needed for new roads and megacities. The Grassberg mine in the Indonesian province of Papua, one of the world's largest and most profitable, is exemplary. The excavated crater measures 12 square miles and over 700,000 tons of tailings are dumped into local rivers every week. It employs 23,000 workers who earn less than $1.50 an hour. Since the 1990s, several thousand Papuan separatist rebels, striking mine workers and environmentalists, have been killed by private security forces. Most of the extensive highland and rainforest regions have been irreversibly contaminated by toxic runoff. All of this is to meet the demand for copper by electronics manufacturers, especially for core components of the Green New Deal, solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, but also for the chips in supercomputers and all the wiring in smart home homes powered by the Internet of Things. Copper cable is still the preferred electrical conductor for industrial scale power generation and transmission and for most telecommunications. The owner of the Grassberg mine, Freeport McMoran, manages dozens of comparably destructive mines all over the planet, including in Peru, Chile, Bolivia, uh, Mauritania, South Africa, Zambia, and New Mexico. The operations of hundreds of other companies looting lithium for electric vehicle batteries, neodymium, for wind turbines, Colton for predator drones, nickel, molybdenum, and other elements for digital devices and networks, multiply this immeasurable scale of socio sociocidal extraction, especially in the global south. In Peru, a Chinese company is in a decades-long process of literally leveling 15,000-foot Mount Toromocho to recover several billion tons of minerals. Another small instance of the capitalist cannibalization of the planet in the service of prolonging the imploding digital age. The toxic methods of removing rare metals from mined ore cause irremediable harm to land, water, and human lives. And yet most smartphone owners, social media users, and Netflix addicts in the U.S. have no idea of where Papua or Peru are and no interest in the lives of their peoples. The advocates of green capitalism and renewables offer fraudulent assurances that, with oversight, resource extraction could be done without destroying habitats, ecosystems, and human communities, but they know this will never happen. History has conclusively shown capitalism to be irreconcilable with con conservation or preservation of any kind. As heat energy diffuses throughout the biosphere to life-extinguishing levels, it's important to state the obvious. These minerals must stay in the ground, and the urgent task is the radical scaling down of a need for unlimited 24-7 energy and for all the unnecessary disposable products and services that warp our lives and poison the earth. One of the defining currents of Western thought is an objectification of nature that cuts us off from our inherent in the limitless creativity and variability of the physical world. Carolyn Merchant, Vandana Shiva, Sylvia Federici, and many others have shown how the modern project of domination over nature begins in the 16th century. Merchant provides one of the clearest accounts of how 
and mystic and organic assumptions about the cosmos were replaced by a view of nature as a system of dead inert particles moved by external rather than inherent forces. She describes how new institutional and juridical forms of patriarchy and misogyny grew out of the rejection of a nurturing and vitalistic understanding of nature and the restructuring of reality around the metaphor of the machine. For Philippe Descola, the idea of a categorical separation between nature and humanity gained acceptance in early modern Europe and was reinforced by a belief in a universal human tendency to overcome natural constraints and instinctive forces. Thus, social customs and behaviors that derived from an interleasing of the human with animals, insects, plants, forests, rivers were eliminated, eliminated or marginalized. A life world whose social rhythms were originally shaped by the alteration of the seasons, phases of the moon, migration of birds, the oscillation of day and night, of sleep and waking, the sequence of festivals nonetheless left its traces on the seemingly insignificant activities of everyday life. It was these endlessly variegated cycles that nourished the shared commitments and forms of association in pre-modern cultures, but by the middle of the 19th century, only fragments of that life world survived. During the 20th century, the tradition-based reservoirs of knowledge, moral conviction, and individual competence were effectively nullified in the developed world by an onslaught of rationalizing forces. At the same time, there was a pervasive acceptance, either celebratory or regretful, that a disenchanted world was the inevitable consequence of enlightenment and material progress. Now, however, it is inescapably evident that Western modernization and its disenchantment of the world has brought us to the edge of global catastrophe and extinction. The great heresy for the religions of techno-modernism and Western science is to affirm that the world is animate and that all living things are interconnected and interdependent. An animate world, as the etymology of the word suggests, is one that breathes, that unites everything in it with the rhythmic pulse of a world soul. In retrospect, a fateful feature of the anti-systemic struggles of the 1960s was the absence of a radical environmental component of the critiques of imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism. There were numerous groundbreaking accounts of the urgency of ecological crisis throughout the 1960s, but this work remained largely unnoted or peripheral for those in liberation, anti-war, and student movements. In 1970, Guy Debord wrote that capitalism's destruction of the environment was the most pressing issue for the very survival of life, but readers and commentators generally ignored this important element of his work. In his essay, Sick Planet, he showed that the consequences of capitalist development were reaching lethal and terminal levels, but also indicated how this disaster is reabsorbed into images and language affirming the ability of existing institutions to solve or mitigate the crisis. When Debat reclaimed the historical slogan, revolution or death, this time the life and death at stake were not of individuals or social movements, but of the entire planet. Unfortunately, many on the left in the early 1970s regarded any attention to environmental issues as a diversion from the anti-war and liberation struggles of the time. The first Earth Day on April 22, 1970, with its dubious institutional sponsorship, was rendered irrelevant several weeks later when student protesters were killed by National Guard and police at Kent State and Jackson State. The skepticism of activists was not without some justification. But, more crucially, the radical left was unable to grasp how the Vietnam War manifested the biocide at the heart of Western imperialism. A unique historical opportunity to merge an eco-socialist critique of capitalism with already mobilized mass movements was tragically lost. And by the 1980s, when some former leftists had morphed into postmodernists and post-structuralists, the patronizing disdain for anyone who talked about nature or environmentalism was all pervasive. A memorable marker of the critical oblivion of that time was Frederick Jameson's 1991 ill-considered declaration 
on the first page of his celebrated tome. Postmodernism is what you have when the modernization process is complete and nature is gone for good. To foreground issues of animal rights, protection of indigenous peoples, preservation of rainforests or endangered species was to be dismissed as nostalgic and naive. New effects of power and commodification were everywhere. It was asserted, and there was nothing beyond or outside of them. The failings of that phase of transatlantic intellectual culture are evident in Jacques Derrida's Spectres of Marx, where he listed the ten plagues of the new world order of neoliberalism. These included unemployment, debt, arms trafficking, inter-ethnic wars, criminal cartel states, but not a hint of impending ecological catastrophe or of capitalism's con contribution to mass extinctions and the collapse of ecosystems. For some deconstructionists, environmental crisis was simply a rhetorical confusion. To be concerned about pollution was to be trapped in a binary in which purity was the reciprocal term. Modern industrial civilization is on the brink of setting the world on fire. The eradication of social formations and communities is intertwined with the extinguishing of the living earth system on which a human commons depends. We're now experiencing capitalism in its terminal scorched earth phase. In a military context, this meant the destruction of life essential resources to deny them to a defeated population or to an advancing army. In a more general sense, scorched earth is one on which thriving regions have been reduced to a state of barrenness and have lost their capacity for regeneration. It is a parched earth deprived of water, its rivers and aquifers poisoned, air polluted and soils afflicted by drought and chemical agriculture. Scorched earth capitalism destroys whatever allows groups and communities to pursue modes of self-sufficient subsistence, of self-governance, or of mutual support. This occurs with extreme violence in the global south where extraction, deforestation, and toxic dumping create uninhabitable, wa uninhabitable wastelands and cities in which the poor become desperate internal exiles. The calculated maintenance of low-level warfare or conflicts between drug cartels ensure the disappearance of anything that once resembled civil society. It's clear now that capitalism will never achieve the complete subsumption of life, still foreseen by some. However, it is proving more than capable of the mutilation and extermination of everything that sustains life. Etymologically, undercurrents of the word scorch go back to the old French escorchier, which means to flay or to strip the skin off a body, rendering it fatally exposed. The flaying of the earth's life-giving and protective layerings accelerates every month, exemplified by the burning of the Amazon forests, the bleaching of coral reefs, the strangling of great rivers with hydroelectric dams, and the massive loss of temperate grasslands. Directly related is one of the enduring meanings of the English verb scorch, to burn a surface to the point that its color and texture are singed and shriveled. This is the present we inhabit now, a bleak world nearly divested of its color, of the impalpable but vivid singularity which gives meaning to our lives. Color is the non-quantifiable texture of our loves and hopes, of human connectedness to each other and to the earth but it is eroded by the unending leveling and homogenization of experience. In a world saturated with violence and casual cruelty, most living and nascent forms of creativity and compassion are defenseless. John Ruskin, for whom attunement to the colors of the world was a moral imperative, provides an early visionary evocation of a scorched earth marked by the savagery of modern warfare and the terrible human costs of factory labor. Industrialization and militarization were, for him, the European death of the 19th century. Writing around 1860, his image of this death is an earth lit by an intolerable brightness that cannot be shut off. Full shone now its awful globe, one pallid charnel house, a ball strewn bright with human ashes, glaring in poised sway beneath the sun, all blinding white with death from pole to pole, Death not of myriads of poor bodies only, but of will and mercy and conscience. 
death not once inflicted on the flesh, but daily fastening on the spirit. Rosa Luxemburg, who, like Ruskin, admired the paintings of Turner, provided a larger historical framework for understanding the cataclysm of capitalism. For her, it was a uniquely European invention originating in the initial projects of colonization in the 16th century. She poses an axiomatic that capital must begin by planning for the comprehensive destruction and annihilation of all the non-capitalist social units which obstruct its development. In her account, derived from Marx, she contrasts the violence of European states with numerous earlier instances of invasion and despotic occupation in Asia and the Near East. These conquests may have brutally pursued the aim of domination and exploitation, but, she insists, none was interested in completely robbing the people of their productive forces or in destroying their social organization. In spite of taxation and oppression of various kinds, peasants and artisans nonetheless were able to continue with their age-old patterns of subsistence, and the traditional structure of their lives endured. In contrast, pre-modern agrarian societies are helpless in the face of what she memorably calls the whiff of death from European capitalism. It produces the collapse of the whole social structure, tearing apart all traditional bonds and transforming the society in a short period of time into a shapeless pile of rubble. The displaced and dispossessed faced extermination, slavery, or the basest forms of wage labor. Luxembourg astutely notes how capitalist Europe is the first place where the uncertainty of social existence and the precariousness of life and work is a fundamental systemic goal, not a secondary byproduct. The language used here recalls how Karl Polanyi in the early 1940s characterized the consequences of an unrestrained free market. If left unchecked, it would annihilate the human and natural substance of society. It would physically destroy man and transform his surroundings into wilderness. Although Polanyi was writing at a moment when it appeared that state-sponsored reforms and interventions might restrain the worst effects of free markets, he nonetheless provided a dire survey of the life world that had been a casualty of capitalism in the 19th century. The destruction of family life, the devastation of neighborhoods, the denudation of forests, the pollution of rivers, the deterioration of craft standards, and the general degradation of existence, including housing and arts, as well as the innumerable forms of public and private life that do not affect profits. Given the current global crises driven by expanding and unregulated markets, the widespread revival of interest in Polanyi's warnings is no surprise. In his recent film, La Tierra y la Sombra, Land and Shade, Colombian filmmaker Cesar Augusto Acevedo uh, presents a searing vision of the lived realities of capitalism's violence. It is a view from a delimited and local vantage point with the global context implied indirectly. The film is set in the western Valle de Cauca until recently a heavily forested region where an Afro-Colombian population lived on small farms, supporting themselves with traditional agriculture based on rotation of local crops. Through the life of a single family, as Veto shows us the ruins of this long-enduring traditional world through deforestation and the deathly onset of large-scale monoculture, which quickly followed the initial peace accords with, with FARC, rebel forces, in 2012. The film's physical landscape is dominated by the monotonous rows of sugarcane planted for conversion to ethanol. A single large tree stands outside the family's small house as a stark remnant of the lush forests that were leveled by the biofuel companies. The protagonist, Alfonso, has returned home after years of estrangement from his family. His adult son is bedridden, ill from the combined effects of smoke inhalation from the regular burning of the, cigar cane, or the sugar cane and the constant use of herbicides. With their farm gone, his daughter-in-law works as a daily wage laborer in the fields alongside other dispossessed farmers, and they are often not paid. 
Alfonso tries to befriend his grandson by demonstrating the bird calls he learned as a child, but no bird ever responds to his efforts or is even seen. The land has become toxic, no longer a habitat for the flourishing of life. A Severo's film with quiet lucidity traces the lines between the despoiled physical environment and the precariousness of social existence that Rosa Luxemburg had described. Foregrounded in land and shade are the wounded individuals from whom the ability to thrive and to care for others has been stolen. A scorched earth is the stifling of hope, the cancelling of the possibility that the world could be restored or healed. This crushing of belief and renewal is perpetuated through the capturing and disempowering of youth. The assault on the young, which begins earlier and earlier in childhood, is a continuation in a, of the neoconservative backlash to the rebellions of the 1960s and the whole political counterculture of those years. Since the mid-1990s, the internet complex has been the overarching means for not just neutralizing the insurgent energies of youth, but for preventing youth from experiencing and knowing itself. To ward off any developments resembling the youth movements of the 1960s, it became essential to deny youth the, the spaces and times for even limited autonomy and collective self-recognition. Over the past two decades, young people have been deflected from political agency and have become the sector onto which demands for technological conformity and consumption have been most unsparing. Notable are the ceaseless efforts to cultivate habits and predictable uh, behaviors to last a lifetime. Untold millions are spent researching the neural foundations of preference formation. Generational segments, Gen Xers, Gen Zs, etc., are invented by a pseudo-sociology to define the homogeneous consumer's tasks that are intended as an inescapable mass destiny. However, in broad areas of impoverishment in the global south and elsewhere, the young are subjected to different and more ruthless forms of deprivation brought on by austerity, indebtedness, famine, and state terror. In question, in question is not a programmed acceleration into adulthood, but rather the envelopment of most uh, waking time by computers in the classroom, social media on phones, gaming, and other streams of content. Of course, there has been extensive discussion and debate about young people and digital technologies, but what is rarely stated is that they are being dispossessed of their youth. They are being denied the possibility of the exhilarating discovery of one's own uniqueness and the stirrings of self-love as the basis for initiation into the world through friendships, sexuality, and creativity. The vulnerable sensory world of the children and adolescents who inhabit the internet complex is now overwhelmingly one of addictive stimulation and electroluminescent homogeneity. Most are condemned to dysfunctional and deteriorating schools which are increasingly modeled on prisons. Ever more frequent schools shootings become an additional burden of anxiety, fear, and neglect. Young people are prompted to find their own thoughts boring or worthless in corporate platforms, train them, train them to exchange or display the most superficial features of who they are. Spontaneity vanishes amid incessant images of violence, joyless pornography, cruelty, and mockery. Music, in spite of its global commodification, remains one of the few ways that can contrive a bare minimum of singularity. But overall, there is a production of subjects who are denied the ability to build a reservoir of memory and experience. The continual adjusting to the shifting fashions and signifiers of social media recall, recalls Hannah Arendt's warning that cliches, stock phrases, standardized codes of expression, and conduct have the socially recognized function of protecting us against reality, that is, against a claim on our thinking. Young people are shut off from the sensuous experience of wonderment, which the philosopher Hans Jonas describes as seeing the world for the first time with new eyes, making possible the birth of conscience and empathy. Wonderment now is numbed or displaced by whatever is promoted as technologically awesome. Online life generates needs that are manageable within its self-sufficient enclosure and it regulates what is permissible to dream. It is only when desires and hopes cling to life in a shared physical world, 
no matter how broken, that a person grows capable of refusal and can feel enmity toward the powers and institutions that assault and smother those hopes. There's an episode in Shirley Clark's 1963 film, The Cool World, involving the teenage prostitute Luann, who leads a degraded existence servicing members of a Harlem street gang. One winter weekend, she goes with the gang leader Duke, who is also her pimp, to visit a deserted Coney Island, where she sees the ocean for the first time. Quite simply, her unexpected encounter with the cold gray expanse of a limitless sky and sea sparks a momentary, incohate flash of self-recognition, emboldening her so that, when briefly unattended, she disappears. One of the core elements of New Left politics in the 1960s was the assumption that young people, regardless of their relation to labor or production, were oppressed and estranged by the values and demands of 20th century capitalist society. A widely shared belief that the young were uniquely resistant to technocratic and institutional integration found expression in the writings of Paul Goodman, Theodore Rozak, Raoul Vanagem, and many others. Of course, youth has been historically shaped in many different ways, but one relatively constant feature has been the idea of a transitional or liminal phase shaped by ritual or cultural practices in order to accommodate assimilation into the adult world. However, by the mid-20th century and much of the West, various mechanisms and inducements of integration had ceased to function successfully, allowing new openings for experimentation and the exploration of alternative pathways and rebellions. Although decades have passed, the persistence of corporate media derision and caricature of 1960s counterculture barely conceals the persistent trepidation at even the partial refusal of prohibitions and mandates on the part of such large numbers. The goal now is to disallow youth from ever having the circumstances in which to imagine and build a future that belongs to them. Instead, there is endless news about young people creatively and disruptively uh, making use of their digital tools and platforms. The priority is to derail the possibility of a potentially rebellious youth, and in order to conceal their jobless, worldless future, there is the dismal fiction of a generation aspiring to become influencers, founders of startups, or otherwise aligned with spiritless entrepreneurial values. But the young are not the only ones dispossessed of times and spaces for interhuman connection. The neutralizing of non-financializable forms of social interaction injures the communicative uh, capacities of all human beings. This is accomplished not only through the relentless lying and disinformation which have long been part of the conduct of states and powerful institutions. More important now are the deranging effects of the maelstrom of debilitating incoherence in which we are now permanently submerged. The internet is the digital counterpart of the vast, rapidly expanding garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean. Within it, the accumulating detritus of global networks choke off any clearing in which living exchanges between individuals or communities can occur. The immense and unending agglomeration of data, whether as images or language, produces a numbing cacophony and disorientation in which thinking is distri- is constricted and the possibility of dialogue crowded out. For millions of people every day, the primary interaction with others is the soon-to-be-forgotten mention of some floating particles of this online Morris. One of the foremost achievements of the so-called knowledge economy is the mass production of ignorance, stupidity, and hatefulness. The philosopher Jürgen Habermas argued at length that language as a medium of mutual understanding is not an important component of the life world, but is constitutive of it. Much of his work analyzed the processes through which the life world was subjected to the instrumentalizing forces of capitalist economy, media, media and technoscience. However, even in the face of what he saw as the colonization of the life world, Habermas was ever hopeful that new forms of media might help support public spheres in which consensus-based communication could occur between responsible actors. Writing around 1980, Habermas's op- optimism about an enlightened modernity 
grounded in communicative action, was tempered by, by his observation that the life world would be as good as extinguished if communication became subject to coordinated and constant forms of deception and distortion. Now, 40 years later, an outcome he considered unlikely is close to being realized, and her everyday praxis is sabotaged unremittingly by programmed unintelligibility and duplicity. Since the 1970s, a number of theorists, notably Henry Lefebvre, have shown how capital transforms familiar social environments into abstract space, that is, into milieus compatible with the forms of exchange and circulation on which global markets depend. For Lefebvre, this was the reduction of the world to a plan existing in a void and endowed with no other qualities. It is the making of a tabula rasa, vacate, vacated of whatever is unique or resistant to being made exchangeable. Lefebvre specifies that abstract space is not literally homogeneous. Rather, it simply has homogeneity as its goal. In his account of these fundamental tendencies of capital, some mistook abstract for a technologically generated order or regularity. Now, decades later, we have a better view of the scorched earth realities of the tabula rasa to which we are headed a ravaged and plundered earth with more regions made uninhabitable and unrestorable. Political theorist Andreas Malm has supplemented Lefebvre's model in crucial ways. Malm shows that for all the demonstrably abstract features which allow the untrammeled mobility of capital, abstract space depends intrinsically on terrestrial resources, in particular fossil fuels. The mobility of capital is paradoxically made possible by immobile strata of concentrated energy. The enhanced freedom to locate and relocate, refine and manufacture, order and dispatch, import and export is guaranteed by mines, wells, gas fields, large concentrates of technomass inseparable from the ground below. Equally important are the massive and wide-ranging forms of violence needed both for the imposition of this abstract space and for the capture and control of terrestrial energy stocks. In this sense, capitalism necessitates the elimination of whatever might impede or obstruct the physical or immaterial flows intrinsic to capital accumulation through demolition, clear-cutting, mountaintop leveling, mining, hydraulic fracturing, and the murder of civilian populations to secure resource-rich territory. Long before capitalism, Roman conquest brought with it this, the installation of abstract plans for encampments and towns. These geometrical layouts were physical and cognitive extensions of the Roman core to the periphery, and they functioned as repeatable templates of imperial control. Robert Pogue Harrison has discussed how the great temperate forests of northern Europe were both a physical... Ow, I just bit my tongue were both a physical obstacle to Roman expansion and a phenomenon that disrupted perceptual and spatial mastery. The vast woodlands confounded observers who sought visual certainties and regularities for the mapping and domestication of conquered lands. Instead, the forest with its vagaries of light, shadow, uncertain distances, and the impenetrable abundance of living matter was an environment that would only be dominated by eliminating it. Um, many centuries later, also motivated by imperial ambitions, the American military were confronted by the impenetrability of the Vietnamese forests and the concealment they provided for insurgents. The horrifying use of defoliants and herbicides, including Agent Orange, continued for over 10 years, not just to create the visibility needed for aerial targeting, but also as a genocidal strategy of destroying crops to deny food to the population. The most consequential event in recent history, resulting in a provisional abstract space, was World War II. Long encumbered with ideological myths and historical fabrications, it's important to understand how this war, for the victors, was an operation of modernization achieved through unparalleled devastation. For global capitalism, it accomplished the essential dissolution of obsolete borders, languages, forms of sovereignty, and finance, or anything else that impeded the remaking of the planet for domination by mega-cartels 
and a permanent warfare state. It was the final clearing away of the residual shards of a pre-modern Europe. The savagery of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the fire bombings of Dresden, Hamburg and Tokyo, all without military necessity, were demonstrations of the irrelevance and disposability of a life world and its inhabitants, according to the imperatives that were to shape the post-war Pax Americana. As many have shown, the war and its immediate aftermath gave birth to the national security state, abetted by the emerging nexus of chemical, aerospace, and microelectronics industries. The famed ENIAC, E-N-I-A-C, computer was completed in 1946 and immediately used by the U.S. military for calculations to predict, to predict trajectories of artillery or rockets. In the same year, it played a decisive role in the development of the first hydrogen bomb. Even in the years immediately after the war, some wanted to use atomic weapons to guarantee the unchallenged permanence of the new order. One of the most celebrated 20th century mathematicians, John von Neumann, advocated unsuccessfully for a massive preemptive nuclear strike on all the major cities and industrial centers of the Soviet Union. Chemical cartels began the industrialization of agriculture with pesticides and herbicides, alongside the continuing development of chemical weapons for use on civilian populations. Life, whether of the body, of ecological rhythms, or of social resilience, became not just an object to be controlled and exploited, but to be, but to be made into a potential object of extermination. Although discounted and trivialized, it remains revelatory that the internet complex is, in part, a product of the Cold War institutions, in which scientists and technocrats routinely planned for outcomes involving mass annihilation. As is well known, ARPANET was designed in the 1960s as a distributed command and control network intended to survive an all-out nuclear attack. Even if much of the network was destroyed along with most life on the planet, it would continue to be operational because of built-in redundancy of pathways and the absence of centralized switches. The goal was to maintain survivable control of U.S. nuclear forces so that the network would retain the retaliatory capacity to launch whatever missiles remained intact. Thus, in question, is a system whose functionality is not only divorced from any human context, but expressly designed for circumstances when society and its members no longer meaningfully exist. In spite of the half-century that has elapsed, elapsed since ARPANET, and in spite of all the apparatuses appended to it, it's impossible to exercise the terror of the mass relocation of social life to a network architecture originally conceived for the final abstract space, for the terminal tabula rasa. The uprooting and herding of populations all over the world onto the internet is confirmation of Paul Virilio's insistence, which seemed hyperbolic in the 1980s, that what used to be civilians are now permanently targeted elements in a new logistics of war adapted to the speeds of data networks. This was part of Virilio's larger argument that the ever-expanding war-making machine cannot coexist with civil society, and that a foundation of the military's agenda is societal non-development. The philosopher Simone Weil, uh, writing in 1943, several months before her death, identified a spiritual crisis of a of uprootedness as one of the most injurious consequences of world war and the dominance of a money economy. Her account has nothing in common with reactionary appeals to land and soil. For her to be uprooted was to be denied real active and natural participation in the life of a community. She emphasized that one can remain geographically stationary and yet become torn away from a shared connection to the past or mutually nurtured expectations for the future. No matter one's environment, whether urban or rural, Whale elaborated on the necessity of having multiple roots in it, roots that engage one practically through work and morally through attentiveness to others. In our present moment, all the new forms of digital uprootedness support the illusion of autonomy, while any vague longings for enduring emotional connections are thwarted by the transience and homogeneity of online interactions. Inevitably, this reinforces our uncomprehending indifference to the unraveling of the life world around us. 
we become blind to the mounting uprootings of a different kind, merciless and terrifying, which are on course to shatter our techno-complacency. Famine, drought, and warfare continue to force millions from their homes and once functioning communities, leaving behind lands and whole regions that can no longer support life. By casting our lot in with the becoming digital of everything, we drift in the hallucination that it will all somehow persist. In spite of our hopes and intentions, we unthinkingly perpetuate the disaster of the global present and doom ourselves to inherit the terminal, the terminal tabula rasa of scorched earth capitalism.